you can you can okay, oh so so what about me? Oh Lord. Um so I uh, went to the University of Bristol to study zoology, and as I was saying to some of you earlier, I thought I'd become a marine biologist, only because I used to do competitive swimming, so you know it seemed to be the perfect combination. Then in my second year discovered physiology and thought it was and it was recording from the eye of locusts, the light responses. And I just thought it was so amazing you could actually stick an electrode and you could record the light responses. And so I got into photoreceptors and the way that photoreceptors regulate clocks, and that got me into sleep and circadian in, in, in general. Um, I had a fantastic opportunity to spend eight years working in the States, uh, University of Virginia, and um, uh, worked in fact with some of the people who just won the Nobel Prize. So, um, Ross Ash, Hall, and, and Young were frequent visitors to the National Science Foundation Center for Biological Timing. So, got to know these people really well. Um, I have to say, two of them are completely crazy. Um, mm -hmm. And we can talk about that maybe later. Um, Mike Young is the same lovely one. Um, yeah, that's a completely off, off the scale. Um, and I'll be seeing him shortly because I'm going to the Nobel Prize. Center, so it's going to be so after, after the States, I um, came back to Imperial College for five years in the biology department and then moved to the medical school to set up uh, a department called um, what was it, uh, Integrative and Molecular Neuroscience because we were really wanting to embed neuroscience and, and, and genetics and molecular biology into one grouping. And then was recruited to Oxford uh, 12 years ago, so I've been in Oxford than anywhere else. And I have to say, it's been, it's been a lot of fun. Okay, enough, enough about me. Um, if you'd like some background on the material that we're going to cover tonight, then Steve and I wrote Sleep a few years ago, which is, which is okay. Um, I think this is a better book. Um, it was published at the beginning of March of this year, and there's a chapter on sleep in here. I think it's it's just more up to date, and it's, it's something I'm more comfortable with because it wasn't edited as heavily as this one was. So, so we got more of our own way, and it's a slightly um, more academic tone than that one. Um, the other thing is that the Sleep and Scaling Neuroscience Institute is our website, and uh, just just Google Sleep and, and Scaling in Oxford. And you'll get it, and there's some useful bits of information on the website. What I thought we could do in the next hour or so, and I'd like to make it as informal as possible. So if you want to ask questions as we go through, please, you know, stop, shout, you know, I don't see you, and we can clarify and then move forward. And so the first section is perhaps the longest, which is sort of an introduction to circadian rhythms, thinking about circadian rhythms, and then the neuroscience of sleep, and providing sort of a framework. For that. Then we talk about sleep disruption, and, and you can understand sleep disruption beautifully if you understand um, the mechanisms that generate sleep and circadian rhythms. And then this very much informs the discussion on this extraordinary association between sleep disruption and schizophrenia, and uh, then how that might come about. And this sort of new synthesis is, is too grand a way of looking at it, it's essentially a, a way of thinking about the observations of the problem. Then, um, towards the end, there's a brief section on, if, if there's time, um, uh, on the development of new drugs, because this is what we're, we're actively involved in, using essentially our understanding of how, how um, uh, substances are interacting with the black and the work to think about uh, defining some new drugs. And then, there's even another subject after that, which is essentially an evolutionary question of why do we sleep? You know, we can actually then think about that as a, as a big question. So, let's kick off with circadian rhythms and the neuroscience of sleep. And state something just ghastly and obvious, is that we sit on our planet that we're all once every 24 hours. And what that does, of course, is add huge complexity to the environment in which we live. So if you think about the consequences of the day the cycle, there are obviously big changes in light and dark, and the way that we adapt to those changes is, is, is hugely important. Of course, big changes in temperature. If you happen to be um, subject to predation, the sorts of predation that you experience will be utterly different during the day and, and the night, and you need to adapt to those differences. The fact that there will be food during the day, and you'll use that and metabolize it to sustain 
that happens. But then you're obviously in the sleep state, there is no food, you're not taking it in. So you need to change your metabolism profoundly because you're then burning up reserves. So the differences here are absolutely incredible. The fact that one's social interactions are very, very different across the 24 hour day, and that represents a big change in the way that the brain um, is going to be functioning. So different sensory adaptations, and then of course the exposure to infection. So if you're moving through an environment and you're encountering uh, uh, other individuals or just moving through an environment, statistically you're going to have a much greater chance of encountering pathogens. So the immune system is going to have to be different uh, over the 24-hour day. And, and in a sense, the point I'm trying to make is that every aspect of our physiology and behaviour has to adapt to this 24-hour world. And of course part of that adaptation is an internal biological clock called the circadian rhythm, which is adjusting every aspect of our physiology and behaviour. And if we just look at a bunch of different examples, here we have 24 hour time base, 2 o'clock in the afternoon to 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and we'll just look at changes in core body temperature, which drop in anticipation of sleep and rise in anticipation of wake. So, in fact, that drop in core body temperature is thought to be quite important in sleep initiation. If you prevent that drop, it's actually more difficult to get off to sleep. And then, of course, you gear up temperature uh, 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 to increase metabolic rate to be prepared for the increased activity when uh, waking and, and, and the dawn arrives. And the sort of pattern we see here for cold body temperature is replicated across all of these other areas of physiology. We'll talk about blood pressure and alertness um, in a moment. Uh, growth hormone is almost exclusively released during the first half of the night, and it's growth hormone that is regulating tissue repair in the dots, for example. Cortisol, or stress hormone, rises in anticipation of activity first thing in the morning. And again, the key point about all of these is that they will persist under constant conditions. So if we went to a deep dark cave, constant light, constant temperature, you'd still see these dynamic changes. Now clearly, if you exercise, you're going to um, increase core body temperature. But the key thing, it's on this endogenous moving baseline. Let's, uh, yes, so the circadian system adjusts or fine tunes physiology found yet predictable demands of the 24-hour day and cycle. And let's look at three examples, blood pressure, alertness, and then we go to the biggest, most obvious 24-hour rhythm, and that's sleep wake. So this, I think, is really interesting. Um, so here we have uh, blood pressure, which is ideally something like 130, but of course in some individuals it can go up to 200, uh, over, over 70 ideally. Um, but what you find is this very sharp rise in blood pressure uh, during the uh, after around about six o'clock in the morning, and of course blood pressure is going up to supply um, the tissues with increased um, uh, oxygen and nutrients. But that um, sharp rise almost perfectly coincides with the frequency of stroke. So here's the time base of uh, 24 hours. Um, and this is work done by my colleague Peter Rothwell. And here's the frequency of having a stroke. And between 6 a.m. and 12 noon, there's almost a 50% greater chance of having a stroke than any other time of the day. Now, why is that information important? Anybody think about how we could use that kind of information? Emergency rooms. Perfect. Yes, exactly. Happen. Yeah, absolutely. So knowing that, that there's going to be that, that peak, you can get our healthcare services prepared in advance. Absolutely. Yes, that is one of the points that will flip up in a moment. Any other any other thoughts? I guess the second one would be there's your point, well done. Um, uh, would be when to take stroke medication. Because what most people do is wake up and then remember that they need to take their smoke stroke medication about the most dangerous part of the peak. Whereas, of course, ideally that medication should be delivered here in advance of the danger. Uh, but that raises real problems because, of course, you're not going to wake people up at 4 or 5 in the morning uh, to take medicine. You've got to get some way of delivering drugs at the appropriate time. And it raises a, a general question about clocks and medication. For example, toxicity. In, in animal models, for example, 
can vary from 20% to 80% across the 24 hour day. And, and we're not very good at, at, at sort of uh, 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 fine tuning our drug delivery systems. This is not a complicated problem, but nobody's really addressing it. Another area would be changes in our cognitive performance. So, again, time of day along here. Um, and, and you see along this axis is a drop in our cognitive performance. And so there's a slight mid afternoon drop, but after around about 10 o'clock in the evening, there's a massive drop. Then, in anticipation of waking up um, and um, of, of activity, cognitive performance goes up. So, this is an endogenous rhythm. Um, in fact, these people were all kept awake in this particular study, so you could say, well, are we not just looking at fatigue? No, we're not, because of course these people have been awake a lot longer than these, and you see that their cognition is nicer. But there's that really low point in cognition around about 4 to 6 a.m. in the morning. Um, what is this dotted line? Well, this is the level of cognition that you have when you're legally drunk. So, um, uh, I think a point, point zero eight five blood alcohol is, a, is on average a, a decrement of minus 15. But of course, at 4 to 5 o'clock uh, in the morning, uh, the decrement is minus 20. So your ability to function is really impaired. And in fact, if you take nothing from this presentation, then the fact that um, if you're driving a car at that time of the day, it's your, your worse than if you got into the car um, and you're leaving drunk. So it's a really big issue. Yeah. Can I ask you please, what, is the, what are the sleeping hours references for these data? Yeah, they're, they're all standardized to the individual. So um, uh, basically, because they, 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 there will be individual variation. So this is, um, I, I think, a, a fairly standard. I think everybody was about the same age, and they were probably in their early 20s. That's my recollection. Yeah. OK. And, and of course, no great surprise, accounting for track and volume, this is the highest chance of having a road crash uh, in a car. Now sleep. Um, this is a fairly recent data from the from the, um, uh, the the latest statistics of the American Time News Survey. It's quite an interesting site, um, and this just happens to be the 25 to 54 year old age group with children, um, and you see that about 32 percent of the life of these individuals is spent to sleep, and across the lifespan, it's about 36 percent. So. This is telling us something important, that, that so much of our lives are spent asleep. And uh, compared to essentially the other bits of this, of this pie chart here, um, in terms of time spent, sleep is the single most important experience that we uh, indulge in. It is the single most, uh, uh, we spend more time asleep than any other individual. And I think this is a point that we're going to come back to later on, about really what is going on during the sleep state. This is very much not uh, an inert time when nothing much is happening, as I'll show you in a few moments. The other point that I think is worth making is that the way we think of sleep in the industrial societies, and, and since the Industrial Revolution, I suppose really, when it really started to take off from the... the 1850s onwards, um, has changed dramatically. In the pre-industrial world, people like Shakespeare, uh, often referred to sleep, enjoyed the honey heavy dew of summer, uh, or O oh, sleep, O oh, gentle sleep, nature's softness, how I frighten thee. It was individuals who were embracing sleep, and it was uh, accepted and, and, and recognized um, uh, as, as being a good thing. And in fact, Thomas Decker, Another playwright and a contemporary of Shakespeare said, Sleep is the golden chain that ties health and our bodies together. Which is really extraordinary um, because the way that I think we portray sleep in modern society is rather akin to how Thomas Edison thought about it. Edison didn't invent the light bulb, um, he was a genius, and he, what he did though was commercialise it. And so, with the ability to invade the night uh, cheaply and effectively, uh, we began to abandon sleep from the uh, late 19th to the 20th century and a headlong rush into the occupation of the night. And Edison's view of sleep is really very telling. Sleep is a criminal waste of time and a heritage from our cave days. And I think that still people don't quite understand 
This is not an indulgence or a luxury, but an essential part of our, our biology, as we'll discuss shortly. So let's now move on to sleep and a, and a framework to think about uh, sleep biology. And of course, here's our sleep and the non REM REM, and I'm not going to go into any of the EEG and the sleep stages. Um, but I just wanted to sort of point out that we've been looking at EEG uh, in sleep for 60 years or so. And um, I don't think it's taught us a huge amount. Um, that's a little harsh, and some of my sleep colleagues will be deeply offended by that. But all, uh, up until very recently, all of these traces that we've recorded from the surface of the skull have been essentially correlated. If you deprive somebody, for example, of um, slow wave sleep, then we know that the next night they'll have more slow wave sleep. But do we know what's going on during slow wave sleep? Well, possibly, um, because if people are deprived of slow wave sleep, then their ability to process information and cognition is going down. But again, it's correlative. Um, and uh, so I'd rather address in the time that we have together essentially what's going on whilst we sleep within the brain. And the first point to make is that the development of memories, information processing, and indeed emotional processing are all things that depend very heavily upon sleep. And so let's look at a beautiful study by Yang Vaughan, which is now really quite old, 2004. It's one of the first really good experiments in this area. And what Yan did was to devise a task that could be performed in an iterative manner. So one to two, two to three, three to four. And, and you had to go through a series of simple calculations, a series of cycles of calculations. Um, but they uh, had a hidden pattern built into them. And what uh, Yang called gaining insight was seeing the hidden pattern. So hang on, I don't have to do all these. I can jump to the end of the, uh, um, the, the test. And so, in this group here, he introduced the test to people in the morning, and then they performed it that afternoon. And you see that about 20% of the individuals got the, the pattern, they, they gained the insight. This is an important group because these individuals were introduced to the test in the morning, but performed it the following morning, but were deprived of sleep, no sleep at all. Um, and again, 20% got the, uh, the, the insight. And this is nice because, of course, he beautifully controlled fatigue here. Um, and then, of course, this exciting group here, introduced in the morning, they performed the test the following morning, but um, they had a full night of sleep, and the uh, uh, success rate went up to 60%. So, showing that sleep promotes the ability to come up with novel solutions to complex problems. They obviously introduced the task, thought about it overnight, as it were, um, uh, the brain uh, allowed them uh, additional insight uh, to, to what was going on. Nice, very nice experiment. This is another, I think, really great experiment because what it does here, this is from Sickholz's group, and what he did was to sleep deprive individuals for 36 hours and then ask them to remember words with a particular um, emotional uh, uh, connotation or, or, or availance. So, for example, um, positive words, love, joy, happiness, negative words, um, war, um, hate, and all the rest of it. And, and those are the neutral variants, and I think it's actually quite difficult to find completely neutral words, but some of the words used were cotton. Now, this is the retention of words uh, for the, foot, the individuals who slept perfectly well, and this is the retention of all of the different types of words after um, uh, 36 hours of sleep deprivation. So we see a significant drop in the ability to remember words generally. But what's so interesting is that if we slice this up into those with a neutral valence, um, and this is not significant, uh, although there's a clear trend for a reduced recollection of words with a neutral valence. Those are the negative, again, not significant, there's a trend. So you can remember um, negative words pretty well, even after 36 hours of sleep deprivation. But the really remarkable result is that you tend to um, forget words of a positive stimulus. And in fact, most of the statistical power here comes from those, uh, the, the loss of, 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 of the recollection of, of positive stimuli. So um, I think it's really amazing because 
There's a 59% difference here in the retention of a positive stimulus compared to the others. So sleep A is the retention of positive experiences. That, I think, is, is, is a lovely piece of work. So we've talked about those three. Another area that's getting a lot of interest is the removal of waste products from the brain and the body whilst we sleep. Not least, beta amyloid. So beta amyloid, of course, has been associated with the build-up of, uh, of, 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 of um, tangles and plaques associated with dementia and Alzheimer's. And um, basically, what these people concluded, there was animal studies first, and then the, the group here from the Netherlands did, did some work on humans. And their conclusion is that sleep deprivation or prolonged wakefulness interferes with a physiological morning decrease of beta amyloid, and we've hypothesized that chronic sleep deprivation increases cerebral beta amyloid, which elevates the risks of Alzheimer's. So I think that's, a, again, a quite an important um, observation. Then, of course, we have all of these others, brain regulating growth and repair, remember that release of growth hormone at night, um, the replacing of energy reserves dissipated throughout the day, and the rebuilding of those metabolic pathways. So, essentially what I'm saying here is that so much of daytime functioning is utterly dependent upon the sorts of processes going on within the brain whilst we sleep. So, no great surprise, the generation of the sleep wake cycle involves multiple brain structures interacting and all the key neurotransmitter systems. So uh, the sleep wake cycle is, is genuinely a global brain event. And what I'd like to do is drill down again a little, a little bit more detail um, into the neuroscience of sleep regulation. And this is very much a cartoon and it is a massive oversimplification, but I think it gives you a framework to think about how you generate a sleep wake cycle. And then, of course, the cortex, as it were, the organ of consciousness, during the wake state is being bathed in all of the key neurotransmitter systems. And the wake systems include, for example, the ascending arousal system, which, of course, is projecting from the hindbrain and bathing the cortex in all of these neurotransmitter systems. And it is turned on by a small structure within the hypothalamus called the lateral hypothalamus. And it produces orexin or hypocretin, and it then drives those wake systems to release their key neurotransmitter systems. So, anybody know what defects in orexin or hypocretin can, can cause? They've come across it. Narcolepsy. So, narcolepsy, this uncontrollable falling asleep, um, is defects in this particular pathway here. It's probably an autoimmune response, it's really fascinating. So, this is what's happening during the wake state. And also, critically, myoenergic projections project to and inhibit this other tiny structure within the hypothalamus called the velva or the ventrolateral preoptic nuclei. This data has been really, really important at Harvard in trying to define the structure within the brain. So you call the sleep switch because once you get the appropriate drivers to sleep, and we'll talk about those in a moment, activating the velva. The Velpo then, via gallop and gallantly, turns off the lateral hypothalamus. So that entire projection and that entire stimulus is gone. At the same time, we're beginning to understand that there are GABA interneurons which are turned on, uh, 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 which induce sleep by inhibiting um, uh, the, the neurons uh, in the cortex. The Velpo is also not simply turning stuff off, but it's also causing the activation of the non-REM REM sleep cycle. So again, it's projecting to these structures and inhibiting neurotransmitter release, as well as turning off the lateral hypothalamus, and then activating non-REM sleep states, and the flip-flop between non-REM and REM as a result of a bunch of neural circuits within the mid and the hindbrain. And it's very important to be aware that in REM sleep, of course, which is our most vivid dream sleep, um, there's the atonia, we're actually turning off, we're actually inhibiting um, the, the neurotransmission release, or we're, we're, we're actually um, uh, uh, paralyzed from the neck downwards. And REM behavioral disorder is the failure to kick in with this atonia, and so people have acted out their dreams and actually murdered people uh, in, with REM behavioral disorder. Yeah. So what is it that activates both? Uh, these these drivers at the moment, wow. which, which, which are, we'll talk about those. Uh, we'll talk about those 
very much in a moment, yeah. I, I promise I will get to it. Um, the other thing to be aware of in REM sleep is that acetylcholine is at high levels during REM sleep. Now that's important for the, in the context of the, the administration of cholinesterase inhibitors, which are being used, um, for example, in dementia. And there is a, a tendency, because they can generate a bit of nausea, for clinicians to say, yeah, well, of course, um, just take them before you go to bed. Which is completely daft, because of course acetylcholine is one of the neurotransmitters that keeps you awake, and it's the one that turned on during REM sleep. And so we've got some recordings from uh, early dementia subjects with on cholinesterase inhibitors taken before bedtime. Their whole sleep-wake structure has been buggered up, um, and the primary reason people pull themselves off these drugs is for vivid and unpleasant dreams. It's really, really interesting. Okay, so that's some circuitry to allow you to think about the regulation of sleep states. And your pertinent question, I don't know your first name, sorry. Joshua. Joshua. What, what Joshua was saying, well, all right, but how the hell do you regulate all that, that, that circuitry? And in us, there are four <coughs> critical components. <coughs> Social timing, essentially imposing um, consciousness by waking us up with an alarm clock and overriding the biological need for sleep. And we're perhaps the only species that can really do this effectively, for reasons which I think is really interesting. Um, but the first of the key biological drivers is what's called the homeostatic drive. And perhaps it's the most intuitive part of our sleep, and we'll talk about it in more detail in a moment. But it's essentially the longer you've been awake, the greater the need for sleep, the greater the buildup of sleep pressure. That interacts with a biological clock, and again, we'll talk about that in some detail in a moment, which essentially timestamps everything, saying now is the appropriate time to be awake, now is the appropriate time to be asleep, and a master clock in the brain then regulates multiple clocks throughout the body. In fact, um, I'm getting ahead of myself, but essentially every cell in the body is capable of generating a, a circadian rhythm. So there are billions and billions of individual cellular oscillators being regulated by this master clock <coughs> in the brain. But let's look at those two interactions in a bit more detail. And so what we've got here is uh, a depiction of the homeostatic drive. And we have an increase in sleepiness on this axis. And one of the agents that seems to be very important in promoting the sleepiness is the release, or the, rather the build-up of adenosine. Adenosine is the breakdown product of ATP, so that kind of makes sense as, as, as sort of a, an activity, um, a, a marker of activity. And, and of course, caffeine blocks adenosine receptors, so you feel more awake after a cup of coffee because you masked the buildup of the effects of, of adenosine. So while we wake, adenosine levels build, and sleepiness drive is not just adenosine, I must stress. And when we are asleep, the sleep pressure dissipates. So, towards now, for example, the sleep pressure in you guys, all of us, will be extremely high. Why do we not fall asleep? Now you have so far. Um, it's because of the interaction with the biological clock, the circadian system. So, shortly after we wake, the wakefulness drive is actually fairly low. It doesn't have to be high, of course, because the sleepiness drive is low. But as we go through the day, the wakefulness drive increases and increases. And that's why we're not feeling falling asleep now. Even though the sleep pressure, if we slice through the optic nerves uh, on the bottom side of the brain, this is the optic pass, we see this amazing structure. Because I'm biased, I would argue this is perhaps one of the most beautiful structures in the brain. And it's called the suprachiasmatic nuclei, 50,000 cells in humans that sit above the optic chiasm bilaterally at the other side of the third ventricle, the SCM. And we see that the little yellow dots here are the cells. And what's turned out to be truly extraordinary is that you can take one of those cells out, you can look at its, its molecular electrical activity in the dish, and it'll show beautiful 24-hour oscillations. So the master clock is made up of lots and lots, 50,000 of individual oscillators all coupled together to produce this master body clock. So what makes the clock tick? 
and I will give you a very brief overview. So let's take the face off the clock and consider two absolutely key genes, two groups of genes, the per genes and the cry genes. And they both have a regulatory element in their promoter called NEMOX. And they will be activated by the binding of b bound clock and other proteins in the complex, which then drive transcription and then translation. And the production of the per and cry proteins, they will then form a complex with my 12 proteins and then enter the nucleus and inhibit their own transcriptional drive. They'll actually block the transcriptional drive from clock and VMAP. The proteins are then degraded in the cytoplasm and in the form of the complex and then in the nucleus. And so then the clock and VMAP can kick in and then you can get the whole process going again. And so what you've got at its heart is a molecular feedback loop producing an oscillation of protein production and degradation. And that is the essential signal that drives the 24-hour patterns that we saw earlier. Now, this is a huge oversimplification. This is actually um, the, the, the way that we depicted this in the circadian rhythms book. Um, and what I've just described is this first loop here of, of clock and female. And I, I haven't talked about casein kinase one and all the rest of it, but there are two further loops, a secondary loop um, and a tertiary loop, and they're all interacting. And it, it really is a, an extraordinary story. This is the best example we have of genes, of how genes and their protein products interact to drive <coughs> complex behavior in the 24-hour circadian system. Now, changes in these clock genes are being linked to particular morning and evening times. So here's a cartoon of where sleep occurs in the so-called normal individual. They go to bed a bit later on the weekends, but they're fairly stable. But there are the individuals who are very delayed and very advanced. And we now have a very good example of a condition called familial, familial advanced sleep phase syndrome. These individuals, no matter what they've done, are desperately tired at 7 o'clock in the evening, 7 to 30 in the evening, and they're waking up at 4 o'clock in the morning. And their whole clock has been sped up in time. And it's due to the change in one phosphorylation site in PER2. It's absolutely extraordinary. This is one amino acid change in all of those complicated genes, uh, proteins, uh, which is causing this incredible advance in, in sleep wake timing. And of course, there are other things that contribute to sleep wake timing, but genetics is very much part of the, or, uh, the, the, um, the, the reason why we get up and go to bed when we do. Okay, so we've looked at the circuitry, we've looked at these key timers, but it's no use having a clock unless internal time is set to the external world. And for that, we need an eye, and it's the eye detecting the light dark cycle particularly at dawn and dusk, that sets the temporal framework for the entire circadian system. So let's have a look at the eye in a bit more detail. What I forgot to say is that the eye is not only projecting to the master clock, but it's also projecting to other structures within the brain. So the eye is critical for sleep wake timing, but also it detects levels of light, which influence levels of alertness. So increase the amount of light for us, we increase levels of alertness. And if you're getting lots of light before you're going to bed, you're increasing levels of alertness, and that's delaying sleep onset. So the acute effects of light uh, and projections from the eye to the brain can also modulate sleep-wake timing. But as I said, let's look at the um, eye in a bit more detail. And this goes back to um, the questions that we were discussing before we started. Here's an individual um, who uh, is, 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 is normally sighted. This is midnight, and you see they're getting up, um, and they're pretty stable at night. Their wake-up time is a bit wobbly. Um, you'll see this pattern again. It's actually an unemployed individual um, who we compare to our subjects with schizophrenia. But this is the sort of pattern you see in an individual who has no eyes. And so you see this sort of drifting pattern. Um, now, in humans, on average, the clock is a little bit longer than 24 hours, so we tend to get up later and later and later under constant conditions. But as you see, this poor individual has essentially no 
stabilize sleep wake timing. It's a complete mess. And we've done a lot of work on these individuals. But what this means, of course, is that we're asking the eye to perform two profoundly different tasks. The familiar function of the eye is image detection, detecting an object against its background in black and white or in color. But that is not what the clock needs. It needs an overall uh, impression of the amount of light within the environment at dawn and dusk. So here we have image detection, and here we have brightness detection. And these are fundamentally different tasks. So for example, the visual system is grabbing light in a fraction of a second, in the millisecond range, to enable us to build up an image of the world. Whereas the circadian system is deeply insensitive to short duration light. It needs long exposure to light. It needs um, bright light. And in fact, it can integrate light over long periods of time. So give the same number of photons over five minutes, or spread it out over 45 minutes, the clock thinks it's brought through the same signal. Yeah? Does it matter what type of light? What, what? what type of light? Natural it's, light, white light? Yes, absolutely. And, I, and I, will, I will come to that, because it is a great question, because it really is highly pertinent. And, and, and so it was this sort of thing that we asked the question, how the hell does the eye do both? And 20 years of my life is summarized in the next couple of slides. And so basically what we did was take mice, um, originally not mice with, with degenerate retinas. They were visually blind and they lost most of their rod and cone photoreceptors. And then we engineered mice with no rods and cones. And so we then looked at the impact of exposing these mice to a light-dark cycle. And then we were lucky enough to find two individuals who also had no rods and cones in their eye. Um, and the results are summarized here. So what we were able to show that with no rods and cones, a mouse can, it's a nocturnal animal, so it's going to be active when the lights are off, sleeping when the lights are on. Could beautifully align its rest activity cycle. And what's more, it did it with exactly the same sensitivity as wild-type um, mice. So, so there had to be something else in the eye, because if you cover up the eyes or you remove the eyes, this uh, alignment, this entrainment, was lost. Lost, And as I say, in these two individuals, we found uh, the same thing. Of course, they're going to be diurnal, so they're active when the lights are on, and asleep when the lights are off. So there's a third receptor system in the eye. If it's not the rods and cones, what the hell is it? And what we're able to discover is that a small number of the ganglion cells, these are the cells that give rise to the optic nerve, about one out of every hundred of those ganglion cells is directly light sensitive. Um, we showed this in the mouse, for example, by taking the retina out, loading it up with a calcium sensitive dye, and turning the lights on, you can see these individual ganglion cells just ch changing their, their calcium, just beautiful, it's just wonderful. Um, and these ganglion cells are maximally sensitive to the blue part of the spectrum, and they use a special photopigment called melanopsin. It's called melanopsin, nothing to do with melatonin, really confusing. It's that the original gene was isolated from the pigment cells of frogs, those, those dermal uh, light sensors in frogs, and they're, they're called melanophores, and so it's called melanopsin. But we tend to call it OPN4 um, uh, today. Um, that's what they look like. They are just amazing cells, and they are they, the, 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 the processes are light sensitive. So what you've got is this like photosensitive net uh, encompassing the arc of the eye, grabbing irradiated information and then firing it in uh, down the optic nerve directly to the superplasmatic nuclei and a whole range of other brain structures. Now, going back to your wonderful question, how much light do we need? And it's complicated. <laughs> so if we look at the diversity of the light environment, I mean, it, it is truly extraordinary, and it's worth emphasizing what sort of light we're encountering. So moonlight is about 0 0.01 lux. Um, a candle and a meter is 1 lux. A museum display set or something is only 50 lux. Um, office lighting is really not much greater than 300 to 400 lux, rarely above that. 
But then when we go to naturalizing, near a window, you're about 3,000 bucks. Outdoors shade, it's 10,000 bucks. And even in England, uh, on a bright sunny day, you can get up to 100,000 bucks. Now, where do the photoreceptors have their sensitivity ranges? Well, we can see moonlight, and our black and white vision is mediated by the rods. The cones and our color vision uh, is easily um, accommodated within the sorts of light environments that we experience indoors. And indeed, much of architectural lighting is designed to optimize color vision. However, the photosensitive retinal ganglion cells are sensitive in the 1,000 lux to 3,000 lux range, on average. Um, again, it's complicated. It's made complicated because it depends upon the intensity of the light um, uh, and, and whether that's inside and outside, and there is a difference. Um, the duration, as I said earlier, you know, you can get away with less light if you if you give it for a long period of time. So the Harvard group say, yeah, yeah, humans can, can easily regulate their clock with 200 lux. You can do it, but you need it for six and a half hours. Um, and so invariably, the rule of thumb is it's about two to 10,000 lux. And in fact, uh, the studies on light boxes, as we'll see later on, is 10,000 lux for half an hour. That's a good, strong signal to regulate the clock. It will depend upon the wavelength. Blue is more effective, no great surprise there, because that's why the receptors um, are maximally sensitive. Time of day is absolutely critical. Dusk light delays the clock, morning light advances the clock. So time of day becomes really important. The task, again, whether it's circadian regulation versus the acute effects of light on alertness, these are different. And then the light history, have you spent you know, basically you spend your time outside versus inside. And also big changes as we age, as I'll show you in a few moments. So, is that, that, I mean, I can't answer your question explicitly, but it is complicated, and a rule of thumb is you need quite a bit of light. And outside light, morning outside light is the most effective at regulating the human clock. And, and this relates to m making the problem really bad um, by providing a weak light without signals at the clock. And those most vulnerable are within the hospital environment or the nursing home environment. Now this is hopefully, hopefully one of the most depressing pictures you'll ever see. Um, and it's 20 past 2 in the afternoon in the nursing home and the light levels are 20 lux. 20 lux. Um, and this is a study by us on summary from the Netherlands. And what he did was to go to the nursing home um, and uh, look at the rest activity profile of individuals. And you see it's a pretty weird, ropey activity rest pro profile. He introduced light banks, and in many of the individuals, was able to beautifully stabilize the rest activity profile. And critically, in those individuals who showed a stabilized rest activity profile, because of the brighter light, um, he actually uh, was able to show that they um, had increased their cognition by 10%. So, so it's a really good example, I think, of regulating light in a particular environment is not only stabilizing sleep wake, but it not, has knock-on consequences in terms of cognitive uh, performance in a, in a particularly vulnerable group. The other thing is I just thought, because of your interest in, in these sorts of topics, I'd throw in uh, something about light levels and depressive symptoms, and the use of the light boxes. I think many of us, when these first were introduced, were rather skeptical, because what's the control? Do you sit somebody in front of a light box and you don't turn the lights on? You know, you kind of know that uh, uh, you're, you're the placebo. Um, but more recent experiments have convinced, I think, most of us that light is an important factor in depression. Um, I just want to show you one bit of data, because it came out um, fairly recently. And this is non-seasonal depression. This is not sad. This is depression generally. And so what you have is the placebo, and I'd, I'd recommend you look at this. Um, this is the placebo here. And so after eight weeks, there is, as you would expect with the placebo, some subtle improvement in the depression scale, uh, depression uh, getting better as you go down. This is floxetine. 
which is really extraordinary. One of the key agents often given to um, uh, alleviate depression. And it's statistically significant, significant only after eight weeks of administration. This is light. Um, so light is much more effective and more rapidly uh, increases um, uh, or reduces depression. And as I say, this is um, half an hour, uh, 10,000 lots in the morning. Um, but the interesting data, I think, here is this lot, which is light plus velocity, suggesting, I mean, this looks, it says you've got the light effect and you've got the velocity effect, and it looks as though it's additive, suggesting that they're acting by different pathways, perhaps. But anyway, I think that most of us are now convinced that light does have a role in alleviating depression, both non seasonal and seasonal depression. Okay, one final bit of this pathway is the pineal, pineal melatonin. Pine melatonin is often called the sleep hormone. It is emphatically not. It is released at night and can feed back and help stabilize the clock. But it's an amazingly weak stabilizer. Given a choice between light and melatonin, the clock will always defer to the light signal. And melatonin in about 70% of people has a slight sleep, induct sleep inductive effect, and we don't understand the mechanisms. But um, it, it contributes, but it's not a big player in this, in this, in this whole area. So why have I spent, my goodness, such a long time introducing this subject, I do apologize, um, uh, is because I want to emphasize the complexity. This is really important. We can talk about disruption as a result of the alarm clock if you're a night shift worker. The fact if you're drinking gallons of coffee, you're, you're completely uh, perverting the sort of homeostatic diet. If you have, if you're a delayed person or an advanced person, if you're getting the wrong light signal, either from the light dark cycle to train the clock or um, bright light at night, for example. Um, so all of these, and of course all the neurotransmitters and the circuits that we talked about earlier. This complexity means that the sleep-wake cycle is immensely vulnerable to disruption. And so we see um, big effects on overall health, cognitive health, emotional and mental health, and of course all of these are further linked. So the point being is that the sleep-wake cycle resides within a mass of really critical biology. Not only all those brain circuits and neurotransmitters, but all those regulatory systems that we've just talked about. So let's now look at sleep disruption. And I guess there are three domains which um, are clearly identified. The first is short-term sleep disruption, the sort of thing that can happen after two or three days. And that will lead to losses of attention, high levels of microsleeps, the failure to process information appropriately, also increased impulsivity, jumping the red light, for example, the, 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 the traffic light, loss of empathy, failing to pick up the social signals of others, and a negative focus. Um, memory impairment, increased mistakes, and reduced cognition and creativity. We've all experienced that after a relatively short amount of sleep disruption. Longer term sleep disruption, as you see in night shift workers after 5, 10, 15 uh, years, is evidence of immune suppression, which may be the basis of increased infection and cancer risk, um, increased cardiovascular disease, risk of diabetes 2, and other metabolic abnormalities, and a real tendency to use increased levels of stimulants and sedatives to regulate the sleep cycle. And then finally, those in the the, who have mental illness, vulnerability, um, disrupted sleep, uh, predisposes to mood instability, increased levels of anxiety, paranoia, hallucinations, and indeed exacerbation of symptoms in bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. Who? Well, depressingly, it's just about everybody. The business community, um, the healthcare professionals, some medications, medications are frequently not um, uh, the impact of, uh, they have on sleep is almost never really tested properly. Uh, and of course, as we've already touched on dementia and Alzheimer's, long before a clinical diagnosis of dementia, you'll be able to see disrupted sleep wake. Um, uh, of course, in mental illness, we touch on uh, stroke and brain trauma, and of course, our teenage population. Examples. 100,000 crashes every year you know, on the American freeway uh, are due to microsleeps. It's huge. Um, this is a very sad um, story. The 2010 Air India Express uh, disaster. So the 
the plane was landing, um, and the pilot fell asleep, and it crashed. It crash landed. This little lad, thank goodness, survived. Most did not. And we know that the pilot just fell asleep catastrophically, because you can hear him snoring as the plane hit the deck. Um, this is a lovely uh, example of a uh, fully rested brain performing mathematical tasks, lots of those the brain lighting up, versus an individual who's sleep deprived. That's the kind of level of activation uh, that we see. And the problem is that brains like this, then are woken up in the morning by an alarm clock, and then they are seeking out stimulants such as caffeine, and if you have a really naughty tired brain, it's nicotine, which is very effective at staying on task. Um, caffeine, of course, has a half-life of five to nine hours, depending upon who you are. So it's in the system for some time, and then what happens is you try and reverse the effects of caffeine with sedatives, either sleeping tablets of some sort or alcohol. But the key thing about these substances is that they are sedatives. They are not biological mimics of sleep. And so some of the processes we were talking about, memory consolidation, processes of inflammation are actually impeded by these substances. So you wait from an impaired sleep, you need more stimulants, more sedatives. And this represents you know, the, the, the life story of many in the developed and the developing world. And it's not just adults. Um, teenagers are increasingly driven uh, by uh, uh, Red Bull and Pro Plus. Um, either over-the-counter antihistamines. Phenigan, for example, passes the blood-brain barrier, so it gets in and is incredibly effective as a sedative. It really is extraordinary. Stealing parental alcohol, or indeed stealing uh, parental um, sleeping tablets. And uh, it's, it's a fragment level of, of abuse that's, that's going on in many schools. Um, go into the, to, into, into the schools and you can buy these in vending machines. Amazing. Appetite is very strongly affected by sleep. Um, under normal circumstances, the stomach is really ingrained. It's the humble hormone, so it promotes appetite, and particularly the consumption of carbohydrates and sugars. Whereas uh, leptin is released from the adipose tissue, and it has the opposite effect, essentially the satiation hormone. And normally these two are in some sort of kind of balance. Um, but what sleep disruption does is hugely distort the seesaw to the release of ghrelin and the reduction in the release of leptin. And after only seven days of sleep restriction, carbohydrate consumption can go up by 35 to 40 percent in healthy young males. And the clearance of glucose from the circulation can border on the diabetic. So even relatively short levels, uh, short amounts of sleep disruption can have an effect upon this, this um, uh, metabolic ghrelin leptin axis. And then the final example is, of course, sleep disruption has a profound effect upon long-term uh, stress hormone release. Short-term, of course, great, fight or flight response, fantastic. But it's, it's probably the long-term uh, release of stress hormone in night shift workers that is allowing them to function at night when their entire body is saying they should be asleep. So we see um, the throwing glucose into the circulation um, because you're stressed. Um, you're not metabolizing it, and you're doing it at the wrong time of day, so diabetes 2 and other metabolic problems, um, heart disease and stroke, um, reduced immunity and infection, and even some clear studies of cancer, stomach ulcers, abnormal digestion, anxiety, mood, instability, depression, and indeed impaired memory. So uh, long-term stress is probably what's causing many of the problems in uh, night shift workers, although we don't know that for sure. And then psychiatric symptoms. Um, across the psychiatric spectrum, greater than 80% of individuals report significant insomnia or sleep disruption. And that really, um, and, 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 and in all of these, so all of these conditions have been reported to have very significant levels of insomnia. So, Let's look at one of those um, here uh, and drill down specifically. Now, any questions before we go on? Are you all happy? Yeah. Sorry, how do you find the link between sleep and cancer? So, uh, very good question. So, we don't know for sure, but the argument is that if you um, 
are sleep deprived, you're stressed. High levels of cortisol. Um, uh, and one thing we know about cortisol is that it can have a massive effect upon the immune, the immune system suppression, suppression. And of course, people who are immune suppressed are more vulnerable to cancer. So that's the connection that is proposed. But you're quite right to flag it up because it's a correlation and we don't have really good data. We don't have actually really good data on cortisol levels in natural organs. So um, that's something that we, Stafford Lightman from Bristol, is, is, is hopefully going to explore. Okay, to continue? Yeah? Okay. So let's now look, and, and don't worry, these are fairly short compared to the other um, Let's look at schizophrenia. So you, you guys will know this, but let me just sort of introduce the, the topic. And that um, if we think about the men mental illness and sleep disruption generally, and there's a gradient of risk within the population. So as you go from the general to the at-risk to the illness spectrum, the levels of paranoia and abnormal perception increase. Anxiety and neuroticism and mood elevation and instability. And, and, and the categories, as you guys will know better than anybody, of schizophrenia and bipolar are are incredibly difficult to define. If you're more of the paranoia, abnormal perception, you're probably in the schizophrenia diagnosis versus mood elevation and stability, you're more quite both. Sort of but there's a third gradient here, which is going to be the topic of you know, what we want to discuss, which is that, oh yes, and of course, one to two percent you're in the illness spectrum. But the, the, the fourth gradient, if, if you like, is sleep disruption. As you go through the normal population to the at risk to the illness spectrum, then sleep disruption dominates this group here. Schizophrenia, about one in a hundred people, affecting thoughts, behaviours, perceptions, tends to start in the late teens, early twenties, um, and people with schizophrenia can suffer from psychosis when I'm well, including delusions, hallucinations, strange actions, and trouble, and they have trouble putting their, their thoughts um, uh, and expressing themselves coherently. Um, I think it's really important to be aware that the correlation of sleep disruption and what we will call now today schizophrenia is not a recent observation. Craven, the father of psychiatry, was talking about it in his textbooks in the, in the 1880s. But then we jump ahead a hundred years almost to the 1970s and the introduction of antipsychotics. And the antipsychotics were almost entirely blamed for the sleep disruption that people observed. It was thought to be just an unfortunate coincidence, you know, a, 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 a byproduct of the antipsychotic medication. And this is extraordinary because people had forgotten that 100 years previously, people were talking about sleep disruption in mental illness. It was all due to the antipsychotics. And if it wasn't the antipsychotics, it was the fact that people with schizophrenia and other severe mental illnesses simply don't work. And so this is, I, I talked about this being in a lift with a, a psychiatrist in Jack Ross, and he said, well, my patients can't hold down a job, so one of them can play. Miss my phone, you know, my friends. Um, I was just gobsmacked when I heard that. I just really got irritated. So with Catherine Wolfe, we asked, how bad is the circadian rhythm of disruption in schizophrenia? Um, and this is a paper that came out. Um, we worked, uh, the patients were supplied to us by Eileen Joyce, who's, who's here at the Institute of Neurology in Queensland. Um, she moved from Imperial to, to, to UCL. And the way we measured this activity, you've already seen um, this sort of uh, plot before, but you can measure um, with this little wristwatch uh, at, at the time. It's sort of it's vaguely hanging on the roadway completely to um, this individual who showed no 24 hour path in their activity at all. I mean, these, these rhythms were truly breathtaking. I've never seen anything like it at all. Um, night exposure, interestingly, and you might predict this, if you're spending most of your time awake at night, then you're going to have a very reduced light signal. And so part of the problem could be um, lack of a strong zeitgeber or time giver. Remember I said you need that light to the clock to stabilize it. And so what, uh, the la lo loss of that in schizophrenia might be an important issue. And I haven't shown you all the data that we've got from questionnaires, uh, poor subjective sleep, fragmented sleep, delayed onsets, offsets. I haven't shown you the slow wave sleep, but 
that has reduced slow waves, altered REM, abnormal melatonin in the sun, free running, drifting through time, and low levels of light exposure. It really is a hell of a mess. Yeah. The same as with depression. Have we tried the sort of artificial light lamps for schizophrenia? No, we haven't. And you're absolutely right. There's, it, it is it is really frustrating. And I've tried to. I've, I've written a couple of months uh, for, for the MRC to do this, but they, I don't know. We don't get very much traction from the medical research council. But you're right. I think that um, light could be very very powerful. Here. Um, the other point I'd like to make is. As you again will be aware, in severe mental conditions like schizophrenia, you have awful health. Um, so life expectancy can be reduced to up to 20 years in males with full-blown schizophrenia. And what's interesting, I think, is if you look at the poor health, what is it? Impaired cognition and memory, increased substance abuse, metabolic abnormalities, cardiovascular disease, reduced immunity. And where did we find that? Well, of course, um, could it be, uh, could, could the sleep disruption, the severe dis sleep disruption that we see, which has gone on for years and years, um, what's its role in the overall poor health in these um, uh, tragic individuals? Okay, so it was those observations and our increasing understanding of how sleep and wake is generated. The fact that it's incredibly complicated and drawing from all those neurotransmitter systems. That we published um, this paper a few years ago in 2010. And um, I won't bore you with the details, we'll, we'll cut to the framework that we came up with. And the argument is that sleep disruption and mental illness share common overlapping brain circuits in neurotransmitters. These statements, it's kind of obvious from from what we started with today. And the point is that if you have a neurotransmitter defect that predisposes you to mental illness, dopamine, serotonin, whatever, it's also going to have an effect on sleep. Now clearly, the sleep disruption could exacerbate the mental illness, and the mental illness could exacerbate the sleep disruption. But, but, but part of this could be those common and overlapping pathways within the brain. But the joy of such a simple conceptual framework is that it allows us to make very clear predictions. So how do we test this bit here, overlapping brain pathways and mechanisms? So what we did was say, okay, well, let's take some genes that are linked to mental illness. Do they also screw up the circadian and sleep-wake systems? And because of the time, I will um, skip over the data, but I should just show you the papers, and I'm very happy to send you these later. But really, we asked, well, what is the sleep circadian rhythm disrupted phenotype of a mouse when candidate schizophrenia genes are optimal mutated? Um, and of course, you can't have a schizophrenic mouse, but you can use these mice um, to test specific causative mechanisms. So the hypothesis was effective or genes that were abnormal, that predisposed to schizophrenia, and of course, I know there's, schizophrenia is a multigenic condition, but there are now some good correlations between uh, uh, defects in certain uh, pathways. One of which, uh, many of which, were associated with the synaptic systems. And so if you look at the way that the presynaptic um, vesicles fuse with the presynaptic membrane and are released into the, um, uh, uh, the synaptic cleft, there's a whole bunch of proteins. One of which, SNAP25, has been long associated with schizophrenia uh, with reasonable power. The most recent paper was this nice study here. And we had access to a mouse which had a dis dis disrupted SNAP25 um, gene. So we looked at its circadian behavior. Here's the normal mouse. It's active when the lights are off. It's running here. And what was extraordinary is the pattern we saw when SNAP25 was disrupted in the mouse was a very fragmented, really massively disrupted sleep wake activity. And again, I won't bore you with the details, but we think the pathway is um, actually in the way that the clock cells are talking to the rest of the brain. Uh, and another model has been uh, glutamate. As you know, glutamate, uh, and particularly the glutamate receptors, have been strongly linked 
And the recent GWAS study um, is very powerful, suggesting a very strong link between uh, some of the glutamate receptors, GRIM3, for example, and schizophrenia. And so we published this a while ago, well, fairly recently, two, two three years ago, on the glutamate receptor 2 and 3, and we showed disrupted wheel running activity and, um, interestingly enough, an increased sensitivity to light. Um, which, if that translated to humans, could be very important because normally lights like this wouldn't disrupt the clock, but if we're more sensitive to light, they might. Um, as I say, I won't show you all the data. These are the, all the studies um, uh, just supporting the, the statements I just made. The other explicit prediction is that genes linked to sleep and clock will also affect mental illness if there's this genuine overlap here. And again, I won't show the details, but good old Lewis uh, uh, Taylor um, went through the literature and, and, and I was even shocked at the number of um, polymorphisms in some of the clock genes that have been linked to conditions like bipolar, schizophrenia, and major depression. And some of the key candidates to come up were per cry, clock, and roar. Um, again, look at the uh, paper if you're interested. Um, and what we've done in the paper, or rather what Lewis did, was not only look at the mutation and which mutations, but also look at the power of the effect. Some genes subtle, other genes actually quite a big effect. Now, if the mental illness is not causing sleep disruption, and there's a genuine overlap in pathways, then we predicted that sleep is a capable of disruption may precede a clinical diagnosis of mental illness. If this isn't causing that, and there's that, then you might precede that before that. And so we worked with Guy Goodwin, who's a psychiatrist in Oxford, who's developed ways of identifying individuals who are at low risk versus high risk of developing bipolar, based upon parental history and their responses to a whole bunch of questionnaires. And what we've shown is that in the controls, at low risk, again, a nice stress activity profile, lots of uh, um, inactivity at night, but at the high risk, but they do not have a clinical diagnosis of bipolar, we're seeing a breakdown of that nice stress activity profile. And in fact, what we see is a statistical difference at high risk and indeed uh, when you have full load bipolar. So I think these are really important. And finally, what about this loop here? If we can consolidate the sleep disruption, will it have a positive effect upon the mental 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 illness? Now the prediction is would, because after all, all of that sleep disruption is associated with all of that crap that we talked about, both short-term and long-term disruption. So we were optimistic. From the first, you know, so with a reduction of scars, improve the level of mental illness. And this is a paper that was published very recently. Uh, when was it? September of this year, led by Dan Freeman, but based upon the hypothesis that we made um, way back in 2010. And essentially, what Dan was able to do was recruit from 26 universities individuals who had a clinical diagnosis of insomnia. So these are students with a diagnosis of insomnia. And so the total numbers are huge. So we had a total of 3,755 participants in a truly randomized controlled trial. How do we get away with so many people? That's because we use digital cognitive behavioral therapy, a program called Sleepio, to partially stabilize the sleep wake cycle. And then we looked at the outcomes, which was did Sleepio have any effect upon the insomnia? And then what was the level of paranoia and hallucinatory experiences in those individuals who showed changes in their sleep patterns? Now, this, I'm just going to show some of the data. Here's a control group. They knew they were in a sleep study. And so you see a, a subtle improvement in their sleep over the study period, which is weeks 10 to 22. The key thing is, what about the CBT group? And they showed a very uh, large effect size. So the CBT had genuinely and massively had a big effect upon their sleep. The question is, what about the other parameters? I'll just show you paranoia. No change in paranoia across the control group, but 
look at this, uh, or a, a significant reduction in the levels of paranoia and the same kind of which experiences after partial sleep stabilization. So partial reduction in SCAR with digital CBT reduces paranoia and hallucinogenic experiences. So this is very much in support of what we proposed. And I think by studying mental illness and sleep disruption in parallel, we're beginning to have some quite intriguing observations. First of all, we're learning more about mechanisms. I mean, genes that were never linked to the sleep and circadian pathways, they were, they were mental health genes, if you like, have now been shown to play an important part in sleep-wake stabilization. And furthermore, genes that were linked to the sleep systems and the clock systems um, have now been shown to influence um, aspects of mental illness. The second, I think, really important thing is that maybe we could use sleep as a potential bio, additional biomarker. So seeing sleep disruption early on could give us a chance of an early diagnosis. And of course, the whole way in mental illness at the moment is that early diagnosis gives the opportunity at least of early intervention. And so I think sleep as a biomarker could be really important. Remember those kids with um, high risk of bipolar, for example. What their trajectory was, they were followed up. And that's a real frustration because we don't get funds to do long term longitudinal studies. And then finally, I think the most exciting is that if we can find ways of stabilizing the sleep disruption, we can certainly have a positive outcome on the overall health of individuals and, and, and potentially actually um, either reduce the level of severity of the condition itself. And that leads me to the last part of the talk. I'm really going over. Are you okay? If you have to go, of course I understand. You all right? See you? Okay. Because I think it's quite cool. Um, I'm generally excited about this. Because what we do with our poor individuals with their eyes, or indeed with this severe sleep wake disruption, I think your idea, or your idea, I don't know which one, about light, absolutely, um, hasn't been done. Um, we should do it. Um, so, there are actually a few drugs. There's almost nothing really to stabilize sleep wake other than sedatives, which, as I say, mask, they force a behavior, they don't buy a biological mimic. So, what we've been doing in lots of different projects, and um, there's a massive data coming through now, is translate the funda fundamental biology into new drugs that regulate 24 hours of time. Part of that has been to develop a company where, uh, it's very interesting, having gone into this, I get a talk and then somebody came up to me and said, well, have you ever thought of developing, doing, you know, making drugs properly? I thought, no, not at all, this is something that hadn't occurred to me. Um, and um, so we were asked to think about it. And there are four of us who founded this company, but I was very, very strong on the idea that if we did anything in this space, I wanted to know what the impact of my therapeutics would be on individuals. And this is, I think, a really frustrating part of drug development because um, what we need are diagnostics which are long-term, cheap, uh, can be used in the home environment, um, and can be used in a variety of different age groups. And of course, most of the time, to sleep, is to bring somebody into the sleep lab for a 24-hour snapshot of sleep. That is not the way to do it. So, um, I wanted good metrics of the drugs we were going to introduce into the population. And furthermore, the diagnosis of insomnia is incredibly bad. It could be delayed sleep, it could be advanced sleep, it could be fragmented sleep, but the clinician won't know what that is. And they'll just say, okay, well, let's take sleeping tablets. So, what I want is something here that can genuinely inform as we go down the therapeutic intervention that you'd use. So, let's just have a brief look at one of the approaches in the therapeutic bucket. And this is, I think, really exciting, because what we've done is a drug repurposing screen to look for agents that shift the clock. Now, what I mean by this is that there are 6,500 FDA-approved drugs, and they've gone to advanced clinical testing. So, they've been shown to be safe, in clinical trials and not to cause any harm, but they're sitting on a shelf somewhere in Zurich or Italy because they haven't cured dementia, they haven't done what they were thought they were designed to do. 
But of course, as you know, um, most drugs will have three or four different pharmacological targets. So what we did was develop a high throughput assay. So these are cells, and they've had attached to them a reporter gene. So as the clocks, you remember we saw that clock model, as the clocks of the proteins are turned on or genes are turned on and off, we get a beautiful 24-hour glow, as illustrated here, which we can measure uh, very, in an automated system, but we can do it in 384 well plates. So this is really high throughput. So we can measure the oscillation of those cells uh, in large numbers at the same time. So what you can do is then introduce a drug to each one of those cells and then see if it will shift the clock. And so this is the first set of data we've got. I think there's only about two and a half thousand drugs here. Um, as you'll see, most have no effect. Is increasing the clock, shifting it to a later time or to a shorter time. But there are four really key groups of compounds that we've found that have never been discovered before to shift the clock, which have a really big effect on the clock. And this particular class of compound, we've now completed testing in, in mice. So this is the particular protocol. The mouse is under a light dark cycle. It's given the drug at this particular time. And you see that in the control, it didn't do anything. The, the animal started to drift from the point at which it released into darkness. The mouse has a short clock, so it tends to get up an early and early in each day. So no change. But with one single dose of the drug, we've had a big effect. We've shifted the clock as if we had given it light. We finished testing in animal models, and the key thing is, because it's already been shown to be safe in humans, we can go to humans in six months. So we're going to be doing proof of concept in humans, and then lost their eyes as a result of war. Um, and we can then hopefully, it would be fantastic, if we can provide something for them to at least stabilize their sleep work. So I think it's quite exciting. Oh, but I haven't talked to you about diagnostics. Um, so let me just give you one bit of the diagnostic bucket. This is the way that EEG has been done traditionally, you know, very abnormal, go to the sleep room. But what Martin DeVos has developed is a little device that goes behind the ear. It um, talks to a smartphone and gets called the EEG. So we can not only use this for sleeping state, but of course, um, brainwave patterns change if you're alert or when you're tired. And so we can use these devices in the field, in the natural environment, um, in lots of different people, because these are really cheap. And then look at the efficacy, at least on the sleep wake timing and structure of the drugs that we begin to use. And as I say, hopefully these can also be used to try and inform uh, clinical practice about the sorts of drugs that go down the road that um, one should develop. Okay, so I'm uh, appalled that I've been talking to you for an hour and a half. I mean, You've been very, very indulgent. Um, but what I wanted to give you some introduction to was circadian rhythms and the, the constantly tuning our biology to this dynamic 24 hour world. And then the neuroscience of sleep and, and some ways of thinking about putting those different circuits together. And, and the complexity here kind of explains why sleep disruption is so common because we're dealing with such complicated systems. And indeed, um, sleep and schizophrenia is not just bad, it's utterly smashed. And I guess you can't kind of predict it for a whole range of reasons, which we explain back here. Not only are there likely to be problems, abnormalities in the neural circuitry, but also um, you're going to start to distort the sleep, and that'll then feed back and lead to overall health problems and an exacerbation of uh, the problem. And that's what we sort of touched on on the synthesis, or on the new synthesis. And excitingly, that synthesis provides us with very explicit um, predictions. And, and we are able to test those. And so far, this, this model, this conceptual framework, um, seems to be uh, at least valid at, at a certain level. And then going forward, and I haven't given you the lecture, or the other lecture I could have done, which is essentially how does light interact with the molecular pathways? Um, because in addition to the 
uh, random high throughput drug screen, we've also taken a targeted approach and identified key points at which light interacts with the, with the molecular clockwork. And so we can use those as additional drug targets going forward um, to help signalize uh, the secret cycle, essentially providing a pharmacological mimic of the sleep. At that point, I should shut up. So, do you have any further questions? <laughs>